Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our special guest is one of the most popular, beloved, and beautiful actresses in the history of television. She won our hearts as the adorable receptionist Jennifer Marlowe in the CBS hit series WKRP in Cincinnati, for which she won three Golden Globe Awards and two Emmy nominations. She also starred in memorable TV movies like The Jane Mansfield Story, A Letter to Three Wives, White Hot, The Mysterious Murder of Thelma Todd, and Gambler 5, Playing for Keeps. She's appeared in countless TV shows like Partners in Crime, Easy Street, Nurses, and most recently, one of my absolute favorites, My Sister is So Gay. In 1995, she published a best-selling book entitled My Life in High Heels, in which she broke her silence about her marriage to and divorce from Burt Reynolds and her struggle to keep her family together. She is the incomparable Lonnie Anderson, and I am beyond thrilled to welcome her to our show. Lonnie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What a nice introduction. Thank you so much. Well, Lonnie, I have to tell you that I've been a huge fan of yours ever since 1976, when you played two different characters on the same season of Barnaby Jones. That's when I realized you were going to be a big star because I've never seen somebody do that before in one season. In one season. Yeah. Didn't we just see her? Yeah. And I probably changed hair colors along the way, too. It was during my hair color changing period when I because I started out as a brunette and then I went, I think it was a little auburn maybe in Barnaby Jones, one kind of brown and one kind of auburn and and uh, adventures in hair. Mm -hmm. Well, your father was an environmental chemist which is about as far away from show business as you can get. And your mom was a model. Mm -hmm. I want to know, what did your parents think of you wanting to go into show business? They were horrified. You know, my dad and mom from the World War II, you know, he came back and had me and everything. And so their idea of, and for her, the perfect life was to make the best match aren't you lucky you're a pretty girl because you can make the best match. That was my mom's entire attitude. You don't need to go to college. You know, don't need to do anything because look at you, you know, you're just going to get a great catch. And my dad who said to me, well, I, I feel that I may have failed as a father if you don't want to be married to someone like me. And I said, you know what, dad, what's happened is that I don't want to marry somebody like you. I am somebody like you. And I want to go to college. And, and so, of course, they didn't approve of the show business. And I have a degree in art education for my mom and dad. For them. And for them. Well, that's what they wanted. Yep. You know, your road to success was not easy. You appeared in Nevada Smith starring Steve McQueen in 1966. And then you didn't get another acting job for almost 10 years. Okay, right? so let me clear that up. That's not me in Nevada Smith. It's like an urban legend. So I'm not sure where that got started, but Bob and I actually rented the movie to see why everybody thought it was me. Then my son rented the movie and we all said, yep, it's you. Uh, whoever that woman is out there, you look exactly like me and you sound like me and you look like the brunette me. Even my son laughed and said, mom, my gosh, even the voice. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I guess I could go on denying it because she's out there somewhere. But what the heck? That's amazing. <laughs> I was sure that that was you. And I was going to ask you, yes. why do you think it took so long for the Hollywood suits to figure out that you had star potential? I know, because I wasn't even here. I wasn't even in Los Angeles. I was at the University of Minnesota in 1966. So when did you come to LA and start looking for work as an actress? In 1975. So you didn't have a long, hard climb? Well, no, not when I got here. I mean, my climb was between college and getting here. I did lots and lots of theater and I moved to bigger and bigger markets, you know, from Minnesota. Then I went to Chicago. Then I went to New York and I uh, toured with Fiddler on the Roof. I had that black hair. I seemed to be fit in perfectly to the Fiddler daughters. You know, we were interchangeable. And so did that for 53 weeks on the road. So I did a lot of theater and I did a lot of national television commercials, which paid a, 
a great salary for somebody who is, so I never had to like be a waitress or, or have that other job because I made enough money in commercials to support myself and my daughter and, and the acting career. So when I had money saved after being on stage and doing all these commercials and industrial shows, all that stuff, I thought, you know what? I worked with Pat O'Brien. You remember Pat O'Brien? Oh, he was in Some Like It Hot. He was in everything. Anyway, a lot of star dinner theaters. I, I worked at one of them. I was like the leading lady to the stars as they came through. Richard Deacon and Dwayne Hickman and, uh, oh my gosh, Alan Seuss. So uh, I worked with Pat O'Brien and he said, you need to come to Los Angeles. And it was a comedy. And he did that with his wife, who had been an actress years ago. And, and this was kind of a payback, I think, later in their lives to travel and, and do dinner theater. But I said, oh, you know, in L.A., there is a pretty lady under every rock. And he said, yeah. And I said, he said, but you're so funny. And I said, yeah, and there's a funny lady under every rock. And he said, but not so many pretty funny ladies. And so that made me think, like, he was the one who convinced me to give it a shot. And I had enough money saved to last six months. And I went to Pat's agent and he sent me to another agent. And two weeks later, I was on SWAT with Farrah Fawcett. We were playing beauty contestants who were kidnapped. And, and that seemed to be it. I just continued to work as I changed my hair color and slowly got lighter and lighter and realized it was the cameraman who said, your hair is too dark, it absorbs the light, put some streaks in it or something. So I started experimenting with my hair and the lighter my hair got, the more work I got. So it was kind of a, okay. Well, it wasn't just the hair, but a lot of people may not know that you auditioned for the role of Chrissy in Three's Company and you even appeared as Susan Walters in an episode of season two. When you compare the role of Chrissy on Three's Company to the role of Jennifer on WKRP, are you glad that you ended up being Jennifer? Oh my gosh, so glad. Because one of the things that was most disturbing about going lighter and being blonde is I didn't want to be pigeonholed. I didn't want to be the flaky blonde. You know, I was a serious brunette actress. I thought I was kind of like uh, exotic and interesting. And to be a blonde bombshell was kind of like, mm, uh, nobody ever takes a blonde seriously. And so even though it was a great break to get down to the final testing for Three's Company and John Ritter and I became friends and stayed friends throughout the rest of his life. But I was so, you know, you, it's the good news, bad news. You didn't get what's going to be a huge series, but I think you would have regretted it. So I just lucked out because it was only, what, a year later that uh, I got WKRP. And I went in to audition for WKRP. I turned it down auditioning for it because my, my ex-husband, an actor at the time that I came out here with, it was up for the part of Andy Travis. So he was being called back and called back and called back. And uh, he kept saying, I, they're going to call you in for this receptionist. And I said, eh, it's a window dressing park. Exactly what I don't want to do. So I don't want to go. And my agent being the smart guy that, that he was said, you know, this is MTM. They do a lot of shows. You should just go in, tell them how you feel, and maybe they'll cast you in something else. And so I did. I, I went in on my little soapbox, said, don't want to play a dumb blonde. I think this is just window dressing. Thank you very much. I hope you hire me to do other things. And Grant Tinker uh, and Hugh Wilson, who created WKRP, were in the room. And, and Grant put me on the spot. He said, how would you play it? And I said, well, I think glamorous, let's do a glamorous, funny, smart person. You know, something we really hadn't seen in 1978. And he said, okay, so do it that way. And I said, well, you know, it's not written that way. So the lines aren't right. And he said, I don't care. Just read them the way you want to read them. Well, then I was on the spot, right? Because I hadn't rehearsed or done anything. So I read them the way I thought they should be. And there was just silence in the room. They thanked me. I thought I had totally blown it. I'll never get a job at MTM ever again. I went to my car, no cell phones, cried. Oh. Parking lot, you know, thought, oh, I just blew it. 
by the time I got home, kids don't understand this today, that you had to like actually be in your house with the phone. And my agent had called and um, I got the job. And the rest is history. I know, I know. But what was so great is Hugh Wilson said, let's do it. I want her to look like Lana Turner and be the smartest person in the room and like go totally blonde because I was kind of, mm -mm. and Jay Sandrich directed the pilot. And he said to Hugh, I would get rid of her because I think she's going to be nothing but trouble. She really doesn't want to play this part. And Hugh said, no, we've talked it over. And this is the, the direction we're going. And so uh, Jay came back for pilot part two, where we saw glimpses of what Jennifer was going to be and said to me, I'm sorry. I think it's just great. I think you're wonderful. So Jay and I also remained friends for all those years. Well, I think you have really great instincts that you knew that playing another dumb blonde is going to make you invisible and forgettable. And you inserted your own intelligence and it, it was captivating. I mean, everybody fell in love with you because you were beautiful and smart and funny. And funny. And, and girls, I had such a response from girls and women and they just were like, oh yeah, I can be that. I can, you know, be my attractive self and still people will respect me and I can have control. And, and uh, young girls were, I, I got a lot of great fan mail from women. I'm not surprised. In 1980, you and Arnold Schwarzenegger starred in the Jane Mansfield story, which got three Emmy nominations. I absolutely loved it because you obviously did a lot of research to be able to channel her the way you did. I have to tell you, Lonnie, it was an amazing, fearless performance. Oh, thank you so much. I, I took my mom to the screening and she said halfway through, I forgot this was you. And I now said, that's a big best, compliment. The best compliment you could ever give me, mom. But what was, you know, at the time, now we could just go Google her and look on YouTube and, and see all the performances she had done and all that kind of stuff. But then I had to go and find people who knew her. And Merv Griffin was a great source because he had video of her and things that you, you just wouldn't be able to come by unless you got them from somebody. And Jim Bacon, James Bacon had stuff. And Jay Sandrich, who was Farrah Fawcett's manager, had also, I think, been Jane's manager or lover or something outrageous. And so I, I started to collect information from people in town because they were all still alive. I, I was at a variety club dinner. And I don't know if you remember those. They were televised, big, huge black tie event. Oh, and, I remember. Uh, yes. Oh, it was so glamorous. And uh, I was standing in the Chasen's old throwback name of famous restaurant, um, they catered it. So we had the food line and I'm in the food line and I get a tap on my shoulder, Cary Grant. Ugh, he's still my heart. Wow. He's my like favorite guy in the entire world. So I, of course, am stammering, don't know what, how to respond. Finally, I got myself together enough to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Grant, but you just take my breath away. And he said, the feeling is mutual, my dear. I think that was the variety dinner for Frank Sinatra. Oh, was it? Okay. Because that's the one that Cary Grant showed up for. All right. Because everything else left the room for me except Cary. And you know, you know what he said? I loved the Jane Mansfield story. And I, that's when I realized, oh my gosh, movie stars like watch TV. And he watched me on television. And, and while I was absorbing that, he said, I knew her, you know, I did a movie with her. And I was like, duh, of course he did. And I had researched that. And he told me what a lovely person she was and how funny she was and easy to work with and so smart and really had gotten tied up in this image that she had created. But the very fact that, that it was Cary Grant telling me was pretty- Monumental. Pretty, pretty heady stuff, yeah. Did you ever find out what M Marissa Hargitay thought of the way you portrayed her mom? Yes. She came to the set of WKRP, just a young girl. She and my daughter ended up being in the same sorority, even though they're a couple of years apart. But she came and got, got a knock on the door and they said, Jane Mansfield's daughter is out here and she'd like to talk to you. It was a show night. And she said, you know, I, I never knew my mother, but 
watching you, I feel closer to her. Oh. I feel like you've captured something of her for me. And then we cut to years later, Gambler 5 with Kenny Rogers. Who's the ingenue? Marishka Hargate. Wow. And so Marishka and I just, oh, she's so funny. Anyway, she's delightful. And I had never gotten to meet Mickey. Mickey met with Arnold, Mickey Hargate, but he didn't want to meet with me. And I was always a little disappointed and hurt that I, because it was his story we were telling. It was based on Mickey's vision of his life with Jane. And so Marishka and I are doing this Gambler 5 movie and, and she'd flub her lines and then she'd yell to me, mother, where were you when I needed you? Give me my line. <laughs> and so we just had this great fun relationship. And then one day she said, I've got a surprise for you. I want you to look at the door. And I looked over and in walked Mickey with his wife. And we were in Galveston, Texas, and they lived in Florida. So they'd flown in to visit with Marishka. But she said, Dad really wanted to meet you. Wow. And so what did he say? So I, I, he said, you know, everybody hugged and, and we all did. It was like a family. Uh, it made me cry. Everybody was crying. And so I said, you know, why, why didn't I get to meet you before? And he said, just one little sentence to me. It was too close. Hmm. It was just too close. Yeah. So but he approved of your portrayal yeah. of her. Yes. Yeah. And we all stood there and said, see, here we are, the completed family and stuff like that. Well, I was just never more touched. Yeah, for sure. And but for me, your portrayal of Jane Mansfield is kind of bittersweet because I remember at the time you were doing the Jane Mansfield story. I remember reading about the struggles you were having with CBS to be properly compensated for the fact that you were basically the star of WKRP. I mean, let's let's just say the truth. Your popularity was keeping that show on the air and you finally did renew your contract and you stayed with the show to the end. But why do you think the network underappreciated you so much? Well, you know, Suzanne, speaking of Suzanne Summers and Three's Company, it had the same problem. And I, it's very, very difficult for women to be comp compensated the way men are. And of course, our creator, Hugh Wilson, did. he said, I created a show about eight people. It's not about you. It's about eight people, and I want it to stay about eight people. So he had his vision of it and his baby that he created. And Grant Tinker, we go through these horrible negotiations, right? And so I decided I would take, Howard and I were really close, Howard Hessman and I, and still are. And I said to Howard, let's negotiate together. And, you know, what, what are they going to do without Johnny and Jennifer? So let's just see if we can do this together. And what we did is we just did a favored nations about whoever, whatever he got, I got, whatever I got, he got. And, and that seemed to uh, push it through. But then Grant Tinker came to me on the set after, I mean, people say terrible things during a negotiation. And luckily I didn't have to be privy to any of it, but hearing through your agents and everything. So Grant comes on the set and he says to me, I just love negotiating with you because you just got spirit, you know, like Mary. <laughs> I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> Well, I would have Obviously. thought if anybody in the industry understood the value of a beloved female character on a show, it would have been Grant Tinker. Tinker. Exactly. Exactly. So what I thought was making a rift between us was actually bringing us closer together. Isn't that funny? It is funny. And, you know, WKRP ran for only four seasons, but it's remained immensely popular all these years in syndication. What do you think accounts for the enduring popularity of the show? Oh, I know. I know it's because our genius, Hugh, Hugh Wilson, who created it, the humor came out of the story and not out of the joke. So Hugh was determined that these characters, it doesn't matter what era they're in. It's kind of like Golden Girls. It doesn't matter when it took place because those stories and what those relationships are and the humor that comes out of the relationships is what's funny and that's never ending so Hugh said I always knew we were a success 
He said, when you would be sitting at the desk and we had a live audience and he said, and Frank or Howard, somebody would walk through the door and people would start laughing before you guys ever said anything. So they were already anticipating. They knew who you were and they were excited and anticipating what that moment was going to be. And he said, then I knew I was doing a good thing. I hope you understand and appreciate how really special you were to do that, that you created a beloved character. You really were an immensely important role model for women who understood that they could use their femininity and still be successful and be taken seriously. And all these years later, uh, you've done all this other stuff. Everybody knows you have a very broad range of talent, but you did something in the 70s that not many people did. That's right. And it was like a first. And I talking to my granddaughters in their generation, they can't imagine it being any other way. But back in the 70s, it was different. It and sure so was. That was. Yeah, it was very groundbreaking. Yeah. Now you start in some wonderful television remakes of classic Hollywood movies like Letter to Three Wives, which originally starred Linda Darnell and Sorry Wrong Number, which originally starred Barbara Stanwyck. I always wanted to ask you this. Was it intimidating to step into those classic roles? Yes, um, especially Barbara Stanwyck, because she was the whole movie. And so I thought, how do I make it my own? So I just am not copying Barbara Stanwyck. And first of all, as an actress, you can say, do I choose to look at this movie or not? But I'd already seen it. So I already knew what, how she portrayed it. So I thought, OK, to make it different, she was tough in the movie. She was not a very likable woman. And so I thought I, for my, you know, version of it, that I would be unlikable, but in a very, oh, nuanced. I, yeah, I was so um, needy. I was needy and vulnerable and, and, and cloying and she, where she had been tough and and sometimes kind of nasty. I just went the other way and became annoyingly needy. And so I think there was a real difference in, in the performance, I think, in, in the portrayal. Do you get how brave that was of you to even take on those roles when you knew you were going to be compared to the originals? I know, and people who got Academy Award nominations, like I did, it was called Too Good to Be True, which was a movie that was Leave Her to Heaven with Gene Tierney. And she had been nominated for an Academy Award for that. And now there's an unlikable character. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. She just, she's so horrible. She kills herself and frames her sister. I mean, <laughs> and I, and I drowned Doogie Hauser in the middle of the movie. I mean, what a horrible character she was. I was in the ladies room on Worth Avenue in, in Palm Beach. And uh, I went into uh, the stall and all of a sudden, I hear this knock on the stall door, and a little girl says to me, Miss Anderson, Miss Anderson, you were so terrible in that movie. I just loved you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay, the woman you love to hate, because really, she was there was she had no redeeming qualities at all. And but it's uh, easy to love you even when you're being mean, because everybody <laughs> remembers that in other roles, you've been so nice. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's it. But now in uh, 1991, you starred in White Hot, The Mysterious Murder of Thelma Todd. She was a Hollywood actress whose death in 1935 was officially ruled accidental, but has always been controversial. Oh. Now, your performance as Thelma Todd was critically acclaimed. And once again, you proved your versatility as an actress. I'm wondering, was that one of your favorite roles? <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that because it is one of my favorites because she was a comedian. You know, she was a, 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 an attractive blonde woman who was a comedian. She, uh, with uh, Patsy Kelly, that they were a team like Laurel and Hardy. So it was wonderful to play her, to research her, and to know that we were telling the story of a particular author because a lot of people have versions of what they think happened to Thelma because it's still... Mm -mm -mm, nobody's quite sure how she died, that we took on the murder of, and why she was, that she was murdered by Lucky Luciano and his group, but it, which made it so fascinating to have the mob in there. The clothing was 
incredible. But I also had a feeling about her. We shot at, there's still her restaurant, is still an office building on Pacific Coast Highway. And we shot there. And so I actually went up the steps that she had gone up to, to her garage, where they found her in the car. And we, I just kept getting those eerie feelings like, like she was with me or something. It was quite an experience. It really was. And it was one of those experiences, like what your mom said, I forgot it was you. Thank you. You know, I really forgot it was you. It's very seamless. Now, I have to ask you, you know, I'm going to ask you about your performance as Francis in the hilarious show. My sister is so gay. <laughs> you look like you are having such a good time on that set. Oh, what a fun group of people. And Terry Ray, who uh, was Terry Ray and Wendy were both such good friends of Charles Nelson Riley. And Terry had been on an episode of The Mullets, which was a series I did in the like 2000, early 2000s. And so he sent me the script just because of our connection to Charles Nelson Riley, And he said, but I know I, I don't, it's not like I have any money to offer, but I've written the script and I hope you want to play this character because it was just with you in mind. And, you know, you get to a certain point in your career and you just want to go and have a good time and be with people you respect and love and uh, have a new experience in the business. And I said to him, I love this script. I love this character. I love playing somebody who is promiscuous, perpetually tip, tipsy, and just adores her gay children. And just, uh, yes, I'm on board. I'm ready. I see her in animal print. And we just, we, oh, we've had the best time with that show. I got to tell you, my favorite line of yours was, if you want to look young in front of your children, teen pregnancy is the way to go. The way to go. That is hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I mean, really, he writes so beautifully, Terry. Yeah. I think you've got a whole new generation of fans because of your role in that, in that uh, series. Thank I, you. I want to ask you, what advice do you have for aspiring actors trying to break into the industry? Oh, gosh, it's so different now. I mean, before, you, you know, you got an agent and uh, you had your, all your union cards. I came here with all my union cards. So I was ready to be hired. And now 2,500 people could be up for the same role because they all send in their video of it, you know, of an audition where, you know, they call all the agents and maybe 20 of us would go in and compete for the same role. And it's just not like that today. And I feel so sorry for these kids because they have to do something to get noticed because there are thousands of people that you're in competition with. It's not that everybody worked their way into Hollywood and, and finally got an agent. It's, it's so different. And if I had the magic uh, words to say to somebody for them to get into it, I'd tell them, I, it's just a crapshoot. You know, part of it is luck talent, an it factor that you don't have any control over. I always say people who, I see a lot of people wanting to be famous just to be famous. And that's certainly with our social media. You see that happening all the time. And, you know, it's, it's something intangible. You can't have that kind of celebrity unless people choose you. You just, you know, I see people trying to make it happen and, and some actually do. But uh, certainly when I started in the business, they chose you and you didn't have anything to say about it. It's kind of weird to me that in, in one way, there are so many more platforms than there were when you were starting out because of all these streaming platforms and all these hundreds of channels. But in another way, it's, hard, it's much harder to break into the industry now than it was when you were young. It is. And even, you know, we had three hours of prime time on three networks. And so, you know, your chance of having the nation know who you are was very good because at least 30% of the watching public would be watching you. And so, yeah, if you were a hit and you could become a household name. Now I could have like my best friend be on a series that has a niche audience for 10 years and I wouldn't even know that they were in it because unless you know about it, you couldn't possibly sample all the stuff that's being done. 
There's just yeah. no way. Now, Lonnie, last year you appeared in a documentary called I Am Burt Reynolds, and you spoke quite candidly and very poignantly about who he really was and some of the issues you both had to deal with during the marriage and afterward. Were you happy with how that documentary turned out? Yes, very much. And, you know, I'm kind of the keeper of the flame. I was the one that had all the home movies and uh, the photos and, and really Quentin, our child, and uh, Bert and I were together for 12 years. And whatever people thought of the marriage, you can't be with somebody for 12 years and have, have no good times. Um, so it, marriages are complicated. And I, I, you know, we saw each other not too long before he died. And we had dinner with our son. And he brought me flowers. And he was so sweet. And uh, it kind of like choked me up to see him. So even if you've had your bad times, you think about, but there were the good times. And then I wouldn't have this wonderful young man in my life without him. And there are other people I wouldn't have in my life without him. And there are experiences that I just cherish because he was 10 years my senior. Dinah was 20 years his senior. Well, imagine Dinah's friends, those giants of the industry that she brought into his life. And then he brought them into mine. And so when we were talking about Frank Sinatra, I remember there was, a, I think it was, maybe it was the evening with, Ronald Reagan, we sat at their table. And before the show, Frank and Dean and, and Sammy and everybody and it said to Bert, come on back to the dressing room. And so I'm kind of just chatting with, with Nancy at the table and, and, and I get a, a tap on my shoulder and, and uh, this young man said to me, you know, the guys would like you to come back to Frank's dressing room. And I'm thinking, my dad would just have died. I mean, he wanted to be part of the Rat Pack. He just, you know, he just loved it. I think he secretly thought maybe he was part Dean Martin. And so I go back to this dressing room and it's just Frank and Sammy and Dean and Bert and me. Wow. And I thought, oh, you know, oh, I wish I had a film of this or something. How am I, oh my gosh, I'll try and remember every single thing that was said because what an incredible experience. And nobody with cell phones, nobody videoing anybody or anything. You're just in that room with these incredible humorists with stories and quips and, you know, batting it back and forth like they, they always did. And Bert was always so clever and Frank and, and Dean and, and Sammy on stage doing their whole act in Vegas. They, I just sat there and I thought, don't even interject because you're in the presence of brilliance. Legends. Yeah. Legends, legends. So, see, I wouldn't have had those experiences without Bert. So whenever I think about him, I think of the good stuff. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing about Bert Reynolds? Because he often said that he felt the industry and the public did not understand him. I think that he, uh, he was so incredibly bright about the industry. And he was so funny and glib and... I think that then people didn't take him seriously enough because it, Bert's kind of a, it, it, no wonder he's iconic because not many people are, can be funny and also be dangerous mm -hmm. and, and be a good director and a good actor and be on, you know, control an audience like you did when you guest hosted on The Tonight Show. Um, there are actors who can't even talk in that format um, so he had so many parts of him that I think uh, everybody just kind of said, oh, yeah, you know, instead of doing one outstanding thing and that he didn't get the credit. And I think it hurt him that people didn't take him seriously enough. And, and um, he was very worried about his performance in Boogie Nights. He was wondering if people would, because he'd always been the hero and he always got the girl. And there was something that was just a real chance that he was taking. And he actually, I have a funny story. He called me um, when it was about to come out and said, <laughs> this is so funny now, I've never told anybody this. Will you meet me in the parking lot of the Bel Air Presby Presbyterian Church? Uh, like at 
two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, what's up? I thought maybe he was going to tell me he had a terminal illness. I don't know. But so I went there and we, somebody had driven him and uh, we got in the car and I said, you know, what's, what's up? And he said, I'm going to leave town for the opening of Boogie Nights because I think I made a horrible mistake. My fans are going to be so disappointed in me that I'm playing this kind of character. And so I'm scared to be here. Um, So I think I'm just going to go to Europe and I'll come back after the opening and after the reviews and everything else because I just couldn't stand it to, to read all of the negativity or just be surrounded by the negativity or the disappointment that people might have in me. And uh, so that, I think maybe people didn't understand that he looked, he had such bravado that I think people thought he was really, really secure and because he could handle anybody. But inside, there was a very vulnerable person. Well, one thing that you both had in common as actors was that you were both so good looking that many people couldn't get beyond the sex symbol image (laughs) to see that you were both really great actors. That must have been so frustrating. I, I th- think it's always frustrating. We, I have to tell you another funny story I've never told anyone. We were at dinner with Steve Martin. And we were sitting at the table with about 12 people. And Steve Martin says, so Lonnie and Bert, like, who do you guys fantasize about? <laughs> so <laughs> I think. <laughs> I hope you so said funny. each other. <laughs> it was so funny. I, Yes, we had that in common, but uh, I think Bert was more insecure about it than I was. And, and yeah, it's, it's difficult. You, you just want to shake people and say, I'm so much more than that, you know, but it's part of who we are and it's part of what people liked. And I remember we got voted like the sexiest man and woman of the year. We weren't even together. I didn't even know him maybe a couple of years before, before I actually met him. And, uh, but you know, people, now some people just get confused. My son was, was working and, and I waved at him from uh, outside the window. And there was a woman who happened to be inside. This was when he was a teenager and he was working at a deli part-time during high school. And, uh, and he waved back and, and the woman said, who is that's Lonnie Anderson. And he said, yeah, she's my mom. And he, she said, no, she isn't. And he said, yeah, she is. And he, he, she said, well, then that would make your father Tom Selleck. <laughs> and Quentin was like, so it was all about the mustache or what? <laughs> so, you know, there are things, like he's an EMT and, and with the Sheriff's Search and Rescue Department. And so he's a first responder. And he said, masked up and everything. He gets funny things that happen because Reynolds is on his shirt. And he said he picked up a guy who was a a little the worse for wear and drink and drugs, perhaps. And uh, the guy said to him, Reynolds, you know who was a cool guy? Was that Burt Reynolds? (laughs) And I said to Quentin, do you always like dread that when when that comes up and you think, what are are they going to say? And and he said, well, what he said, mom, was... um, and that Lonnie Anderson, what a dame. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I, they're still married. And Quentin was like, no, I'm pretty sure he died. <laughs> when he said, no, he didn't, no. No, they're somewhere together. They're, they're still married, <laughs> I thought. And I said, what did he ever, I never told him, he said. And, and I, he said, luckily I had my mask on so he couldn't see uh, me laughing. And he said, my, my partner and I were just cracking up. So, you see, the uh, pandemic has had one benefit with the mask. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, Lonnie, exactly. when Cher's ex-husband, Sonny Bono, died, she said that if she'd known he was going to die, she would have had one last conversation with him to make sure he knew how she really felt about him. Did you ever feel that way after Bert died? Yes. I wish that we had. I mean, the dinner was very lovely and everything, but but it wasn't like... I'm not ever going to see you again because we had lots of, you know, dinners together with, with Quentin, just so he would know that there was love and he had been brought into a loving relationship. And so, yeah, I wish I had had uh, a last conversation with him so that, because he was pretty down at the end. 
Um, and Quentin and I had gone to the motion picture home and uh, signed him up because Quentin wanted to take care of him because he wasn't, he wasn't well, even though he was going to do the movie um, with Quentin Tarantino, uh, he still was having a hard time getting around and stuff. And Quentin said, it's my, it's my turn to take care of him, mom. So let's bring him out here. And we got everything all set up and, and he died. I mean, it was just a coincidence. And I think my son always felt like, oh, darn, I wish I had done it earlier. And uh, so we would have had that time. Well, you know, anybody who was following the story, at least speaking for myself, the tabloids were just so in your face. They were just constantly hounding you. You were trying to raise a child. And I've got to tell you, by all accounts, your son is so grounded, so centered. He's really turned out so balanced. And you deserve a whole lot of credit for that because that was a very surreal period of your life. Very. And I'm so lucky that he is that wonderful person. And, and my daughter also. I mean, I just have great kids and fabulous grandkids and two kids who really didn't want anything to do with show business. But my granddaughters think I'm, I'm kind of hip and cool, you know. Oh, I can yeah, see yeah, why. Yeah. <laughs> now, in, in, in 1995, you wrote a highly emotional and compelling book entitled My Life in High Heels, which I found very moving. I can't even imagine how painful it must have been for you to open up your life with Bert to the public in the way that you did. Whatever you wanted to achieve by writing that book, do you think you achieved it? I think so. I think it's, it's something I always say about writing a book that maybe everybody should do it and leave it to your children and your grandchildren because maybe someday they were gonna to wanna to ask you a question and you won't be there for them and, and it's there in the book for them to see. So it was very good for me to, it was very difficult because uh, you have to relive your whole life, all of the, the ups and the downs and the tragedies and, and, uh, and the good times. And, but I felt very much like I wanted to say, I loved him. We are not this, you know, crazy, battling, warring, insane couple that there was great love there. And I, and I want that. And I want to write that for our son and my daughter and, and all of the people that, that loved us as a couple. If I don't speak up and just let it be the tabloids version, um, then I'll always regret it. Well, it's been 26 years since the book came out. And with the passage of time, is there anything you would change if you had the chance to go back and rewrite the book? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I think there probably, there are probably not change, but more things that I would be more open about and uh, more introspective about. I still was protecting him um, in the book and or thought I was protecting him. And I think that I may have done him a disservice in the fact that people should have known how vulnerable he really was. I think it came through. I just wonder, well, number one, would you ever consider writing another book? Because I mean, the chapter on being in the dressing room with the Rat Pack alone is worth <laughs> the price of the book. You know what I know? You know, I was on Oprah for two consecutive weeks talking about the book. And she said to me, you have to write like my life in flats or whatever you, your next book is, but you have to write another one. And, and of course, then, like you said, 26 years, that's a lot of, a lot of living to do. And I have lots of stories to tell. I often think maybe I should just do a one woman show and tell my stories. Well, one question I have to ask you, uh, if you could have chosen any celebrities to be your parents, who would you have chosen? <laughs> oh, I know this. Doris Day, my mother, absolutely adored her always and wanted to be just like her. And I just loved everything about her. And Walt Disney, because he was so creative. And um, I have my degree from the University of Minnesota is in art. And I wanted to be an animator if I couldn't be an actress. And uh, I was never good enough. But so the admiration I have for him and the world that he created out of his imagination 
so spectacular. Those two people, I would be the, the luckiest person on the face of the earth. I think. It's a very interesting uh, duo you mentioned because Doris never made a movie for Walt Disney. I know. <laughs> and yet who better, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, she would have put a totally different spin on Mary Poppins, don't you think? <laughs> I think so, I, absolutely. <laughs> you know, Lonnie, in talking with you, I get the sense that you're at a really good place in your life these days. There's a sense of serenity and contentment about you. It's really nice to see you looking so happy. Thank you. Well, part of that happiness comes from the fact that I'm married to a wonderful man that I met in 1963. I was in high school. And I went to the opening of a movie in Minneapolis, where I grew up. I had a lot of uh, first showings and stars that came through town. And this was a movie called 55 Days of Peking with Charlton Heston and Ava Gardner. And I was kind of, my high school weekend job was that I, well, I got hired by like, I guess the local paparazzi, the guys that wanted to get their pictures into the newspaper. And they thought that maybe if it had a cute girl in it, they'd sell it. And so they used to just hire me and I would go like be in the shot. And so this was, they said the brothers four, the singing group who do the music for this movie, 55 Days of Peking, are going to be at the opening. And we want to photograph you with them and then we'll get our, our photos in, in the paper. And so I, I said, oh, okay. So I got myself all fixed up and went to the theater and met the brothers four. And I got my, my album signed, you know, and I'm, I'm standing there. And of course it did get in the newspaper. And, and then the, the tall one, the funny one. was and so the best funny. looking one. Uh, yeah, it, just adorable guy. And, and I'm just flirting my toes off there with him. And he says, you know, I think you should sign the albums too. Just sign Ava G Gardner. I, of course, being a brunette at the time, but like I was 17 years old or something. And he said, just sign Ava Gardner. They'll never know. <laughs> anyway, he was so fun and funny. And, and so I asked them if they were really brothers and they said, no, we're fraternity brothers. And so I figured, oh, they're college guys. Okay. So I asked them how old they were and they said they were 24. And I'm thinking, ooh, ooh, ooh. And so they asked me where I went to school. And I said, the University of Minnesota. And I'm a senior. <laughs> I just lied my, oh my gosh. And because I didn't want them to think I was a baby. And so I told this and they invited me to lunch and they gave me tickets to their concert that night. And I just kept pretending that I was uh, this college girl. And uh, I took my cousin with me to the, the theater to watch them. And I said, remember, we're in college. And and, uh, you know, and we can't go for a drink because, oh, we have to, it was a Saturday night. We have to get up and teach Sunday school in the morning. So we have to leave or whatever our excuse is going to be. But they, you know, we'll never, I'll never see him again. So let's just go and be all sophisticated. And so he walked me to the car after the concert and asked for my number and, and kissed me goodnight. And so I thought, what a great story I'll have for Monday at school. <clears throat> to say, this is what I did with my weekend. But he did call me from all over the world. And, and we had great, fun experiences. Much, you know, a much simpler time. I don't know, but we were just good kids. Nobody had sex. You know, a, a kiss goodnight was like as far as it went. And even though he was an older guy, and my dad had the big talk with him, you know, if you're going to date my daughter, jailbait then this is the way you have to act. And he was such a gentleman. And I was so crazy mad for him. And oh, we went to Chicago and I met um, Hugh Hefner at the, the mansion. I had no idea who he was. And then for my 18th birthday, he took me to his hometown, Seattle, where we went to the top of the Space Needle for my 18th birthday. And Harry Belafonte was with us and he sang to me and stuff. So, oh my gosh. You I, have to write another book. I know. I know. So, so much fun. But of course, he's traveling all over the world and I'm going to school. So it, we drifted apart. And then like 2003, I saw him on a PBS special, one of those pledge break things. And I thought, oh, shallow. He's still cute. <laughs> I wonder what happened to him. Like, did he get married and have 10 children? 
anyway, I was doing a, uh, a speaking tour, trying to get kids to not smoke. And it was all about COPD because both my parents had COPD, big mm -hmm. 40s smokers glam. So I was in Seattle and I called his office number. He answered the phone. And I said, this is Lonnie. I didn't know. This is Lonnie Anderson. I'm looking for my friend, Bob Plick. And uh, there was this long silence. And he said, I'm trying to think of something clever to say about Minnesota. So I was so glad that he knew that that brunette girl was me. And uh, we went to dinner and in the middle of dinner, uh, and you didn't have 10 children. And <laughs> so we were both free and uh, at the time unattached. And just in the middle of dinner, he said something and I thought, y you know, you, you are still it. I can't believe it after all wow. these years. It may still be the one. So we've been married now since uh, 2008 for 13 years. Well, congratulations. I, I said to Bob before the interview that he's a late bloomer. <laughs> but in a way, you know, I think the fact that you both evolved the way you did, I mean, I believe in karma. I think things happened exactly the way your destiny planned for it to happen. And the appreciation that you each have for each other and for your kids, your grandkids, is just a perfect time in your life, don't you think? I think so. I think it's just wonderful that we've had the careers we have, we have the family that we have, and now we're blending them all together. And and I still, I wish my mom were here and my dad, because I used to say, he's so funny that if we were stranded in a cabin in the wilderness, he's funnier than TV. So I think of the last year and a half that we've been stranded in a cabin in the wilderness, of course, during this whole COVID thing. And, and I was right. He's better than TV. He's just so wonderful. And I know a lot of people who, who've come to not like one another after spending a pandemic together. And he just is everything that I always thought he would be. Do you really get how popular you are? Sometimes yes. And most of the time, no because I'm just me. And my daughter used to say, mom, how come there aren't any pictures of us like just sitting, eating popcorn, watching a movie? I said, how interesting is that? That's just like everybody else. They usually have to run with the story of something outrageous. So I said, so let's think of it as we're us. And then there's that Lonnie Anderson family over there. They're having a whole different life. We're not living it. We're living ours and it's just us. So most of the time, I think that's why I don't do a lot of social media and stuff like that, because I feel like I want to just be me. And maybe that's how I got the great kids and the great people in my life that I have, is that I'm not all caught up in that. No, you never lost touch with who you really are. And you understood the difference between Lonnie Anderson, the image, and Lonnie Anderson, the mom, and the friend, and the wife, and the person. And I just, I, I want to ask you, what's what's next for you to conquer? I know you're going to be unveiling a statue very soon. Yes, of, uh, of Bert. He's buried at, his ashes are buried at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And it's right by Paramount. And they also run movies. They've been running Bert movies all month. And they're going to show the documentary. And on the 20th, of September. Anyway, the unveiling is a statue that's been created of him. It's a pillar with a two foot bust with cowboy hat and mustache because that's who he is. And Quentin and I picked out the spot where he is, which is under a beautiful palm tree by the water, all the things that he would love next to all the icons that he adored. And so that will be unveiled and then they're going to run the documentary and uh, we'll all celebrate what an iconic person and what a life he had. Uh, I hope you have a, a wonderful time at that event. It's gonna be very emotional and poignant and, and in a way, a kind of closure. It is, and it's good for my son to have that. He's, like he said, I, this is good. I'll, I have some place to go and talk to him when I want to. Well, Lonnie, I know you don't do a lot of media uh, interviews or social media. I am immensely honored and grateful that you took the time to appear on our show. Getting to chat with you has been a real 
highlight for me and for oh, our viewers. You so thank you. You're just great. You're just a great interviewer and a, a lovely man. Oh, Lonnie, thank you so much. Please come back anytime. You are always welcome on our show. Thank you. Our guest has been the fabulous Lonnie Anderson. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.